Thank you so much for having me. It is a delight to be here in Omaha to talk about the coming of energy democracy, or as I have called it, energizing the good life, uh, playing off of your state motto. So as I do with all of my presentations, I like to start with a little history, because I think understanding the history of the electricity system gives us a really good understanding of how we got to where we are. And it turns out a lot of board games happen to have titles that are very good for describing that history. Um, and here's a few examples. Uh, ranging from the game of life to the price is right to aggravation or risk, uh, or even if you like rotten apples. Um, but the one I think is most appropriate uh, to describe uh, where we're at is monopoly, and that's because that's the way that we've structured the electricity system for years and years. And you can see here that um, you know the, the mon what that monopoly meant essentially was that um, the there's one utility company that would control everything from the power plants and transmission power lines to the distribution network that pulls and wires that run through our alleys to the meters on our buildings. Um, and it was a monopoly in two senses, not two senses, uh, monopoly, it was a monopoly in two senses, not only over the control and management of the system, a command and control system, but also over the generation of electricity. And as we'll see in, in over the course of this presentation, um, the times, they are a changing. And that monopoly model no longer fits with the economic or the technological uh, um, paradigm that we see facing the electricity system. And there are a number of ways in which they're changing. I'm going to run through a few specific sort of technology-driven changes, but then also talk about what the big picture is and how that's uh, having enormous implications for this notion of how uh, we've had a game of monopoly um, in our electricity sector. So one of them, I, this is one of my favorite examples to give, is uh, some of the, the, the large impact you can have with small things. This is an example of a bill and it was created by a company called Opower. They now contract with electric companies around the country. And what they do is what's called behavioral energy savings, which is to say that they use smiley faces on energy bills to highlight people who are doing well and not smiley faces for folks who are using too much energy. And just by doing this on everybody's electric bill, they were able to drive uh, anywhere from 1% to 3% reduction in energy consumption because people want to get a smiley face and motivates them to do something different. And so... Um, it's one small thing that we can do without deploying any additional money in terms of light bulbs or uh, Energy Star appliances um, and something very easy that we can tackle. And it's, of course, something that a lot of utilities simply weren't doing, and a lot of them still aren't, frankly. So I call up your utility and ask them if they're doing this. Um, you have other things like radio controls for um, uh, air conditioners. So a utility, many utilities across the country use this as called demand response or demand control, controllable load. Um, and what they do is they put a little radio device on the outside of your house um, when the utility needs a little bit more power or they want to reduce energy consumption so they don't have to turn on a more expensive power plant, uh, they can radio in and shut that off for 15 minutes. You get a credit on your bill for that. Um, and it's enough, and unfortunately, I don't know why my slides are being cut off here, but um, it's enough uh, for the, the, the utility that serves uh, Minnesota uh, saves 330 megawatts uh, of energy demand with their uh, demand response program, which is about the same as a medium-sized gas-fired power plant. It's really a remarkable amount of energy savings they're able to do with just one appliance uh, on radio control. And, uh, of course, there are other things like smart thermostats, and uh, they are decentralizing the way that we are able to control our energy use. Not only are we able to uh, program them, uh, if we're so fortunate, or find somebody younger to help us program them, um, or, or we're able to control them from our devices. I could right now, this is actually a picture of, of my thermostat in my house, and I could pull it up on my phone here and make it very warm for my wife and kids right now. Um, but there's an unprecedented level of control, and these devices, again, are having some very big savings. Um, the electricity piece is missing here, but between 10 and 15 percent uh, uh, of energy consumption for heating and cooling uh, can be accomplished through things like programmable thermostats. Again, you know, power in the hands of people. And of course, now we have energy storage coming, uh, technologies that will allow us to store energy, to shift energy use, uh, to accommodate uh, renewable energy resources. So, some remarkable technologies that are coming in uh, that are radically changing the way that we're able to control the energy system. So, writ large, though, it's having some very big packs, impacts on the electricity system as a whole. And so, uh, we're going to do this here. We're going to ask a question, which is, um, in what year did electricity sales nationwide peak? Uh, what was the last year that they actually grew? And so, uh, I'll give you a second to absorb the different options here, and then I'm going to ask you to raise your hand for anybody for 2013. <coughs> Got one over there, 2010. A few folks there. How about 2007? A few folks there. 2005? He was very optimistic about energy conservation. Anybody earlier? 
The answer is, remarkably, what you can't see, because I'm missing it on the bottom here, is 2007. We actually have not had uh, a nationwide increase in our electricity sales since 2007. Um, and there's a lot of different factors there that was right before a recession, obviously, and so that had a significant impact. Um, but in terms of uh, once we've rebounded from that, we actually have not seen an increase. And a lot of the factors that I mentioned previously, technologies that we've been able to deploy are having a big impact, as well as public policy requiring utilities uh, to prioritize energy savings. So a second factor, of course, is also imp impacting uh, the changes in the electricity system. And so it's not just energy demand, but it's also energy supply. And so in, in every year, we build new power plants in this country. A lot of times, it's because there's new demand in some places. A lot of times, because we're retiring power plants. And, uh, and, and an increasing amount of that capacity in every year is coming from uh, renewable energy resources. And in fact, it has been a number of years uh, uh, since fossil fuels provided more than 60% of that capacity. And so we're going to go to the audience here again uh, for a question. And I know you want to test and see if that works. Like, go back. Uh, so let's go ahead and try this question. So I think I even have the same years as on the previous one. So I think 2013 is the first option. What was the last year in which fossil fuel, like coal and natural gas, provided more than 60% of new power plant capacity? Anybody for 2013? Good. We've got some optimists here. 2010. A few for 2010. 2007. 2005. Anybody for earlier? I don't think as many people voted this time. I just have to say, participation is important, people. Um, the answer is 2005. We've actually had a really remarkable shift in terms of uh, new power plant deployments, uh, and that renewables represented in green ha have become, uh, in many years, the dominant source of new power plant capacity. But what's even more remarkable is when you break this down and you look at um, wh where those renewables are coming from. Solar, of course, is growing very rapidly, but the one I want to highlight is small solar, which is uh, a megawatt and smaller. A megawatt serves about 200 homes. It'd be the rooftop of a Walmart store. Um, 18% of the new capacity added to the grid in the first half of this year came from small solar, came from rooftop solar on homes and businesses. So there's really a remarkable shift taking place in our electricity system where power generation is being distributed, where we are generating power not only from new resources, but from new places and from places that aren't the electric com company. And of course, there's a great example of this. This uh, photo was taken from a uh, story in the Lincoln Journal Star uh, just a few weeks ago about farmers uh, go, uh, who are going solar uh, in Nebraska. And there are some other interesting pressures, of course, going on as well. Um, this is a chart taken from the Midwest Independent System Operator, which operates a transmission grid over uh, much of the Midwestern region. Um, the prices of wholesale electricity are going down for two reasons. One is that, of course, natural gas prices are low because of the glut of natural gas from fracking, uh, but also because of the availability of wind power on the system, uh, which has no fuel cost and therefore can bid in and drive down electricity costs. And it's actually one of the things you don't hear about a lot is that even though it does, yes, cost money to build wind power plants, because they have no fuel costs, they can operate sometimes even at negative prices, which means they actually pay a little bit to get into the grid system. Um, they will drive down wholesale prices for everybody else. Um, there's a dis uh, I, I should mention one other thing, though, which is interesting about the Omaha Public Power District, which is this is actually a problem for them because they have excess generation, which they like to sell on the wholesale market, and so low prices can be a problem when uh, you have uh, overcapacity. So in general, what this has meant, at least here in Omaha, is uh, relatively low prices. The average retail electricity price uh, for residential customers in the Midwest is about 12 cents, and for, in Omaha it's 8 cents. Yeah, question? I don't know if you want to take questions next slide or at the end. I prefer clarifying questions now and then big picture questions at the end. All right. Is this only specifically rates, or does it include fixed parts of the bill? We're going to get to that. Great. I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> I don't usually spend as much time on fixed charges, but I've got a section on it today. Because uh, it is becoming a very big issue in this issue of energy democracy. So, of course, cheap power doesn't mean that it is not costly. And this is an example from Minnesota. One of our um, uh, environmental organizations has done a lot um, in working with the Sierra Club and others uh, on opposing coal power in Minnesota. And it's very costly, the health and environmental impacts of coal power, uh, which represents about 50% of the supply in the state of Minnesota, are still quite remarkable and something that we are working very hard on. Uh, to transition our utilities away from, but also trying to keep, in, keep them from supplanting coal with natural gas, which has its own health and environmental impacts um, that are often ignored because uh, they've been very good at marketing that they're cleaner. So where we're going writ large, though, with this is a transition from, you know, we, I mentioned at the beginning this game of monopoly where one entity, the utility company, has centralized control over the way we generate power, but also over the way we operate the system, to more of a decentralized network where you can have 
homes and businesses that are generating power um, uh, from all sorts of different sources. You have electric vehicles. We're going to have energy storage. Um, and we're really, the technology, and uh, the communications technology, whether it's smartphones and the technology uh, for power generation like solar are, are rapidly allowing for decentralized control of the system. And that's putting it in tension uh, with the way uh, that we sort of politically and the rules that we've used to, uh, to structure the system. So the question is, are we going to move forward or backward on this graph here? Are we, are we moving toward a democratic energy future, an energy democracy future, or are we moving backward? In some cases, it seems like we're moving forward and that our utilities are recognizing the value of decentralized energy. In any event, there are, there are a number of utilities who are looking at technologies like solar and, and the, the shift that's happening and saying, hey, this is actually working out okay for us. This, is, this, this can meet our needs. Um, and, and that we're actually a long way from taking full advantage of it. I mean, that there's a 1% limit on, on net metering uh, for this utility company, and they're not anywhere close to meeting it. There's a great opportunity to develop more solar. But on the other hand, there's this issue of fixed charges. Thank you so much for bringing it up. Um, so this is taken from OPVD, and it represents their proposal to increase the fixed charge portion of the bill. So your bill is divided into two parts. I'm guessing that most of you are already familiar with this, but in case you aren't, uh, if you take, for example, the, the two bars on the left there, um, the green part represents how much you pay, what portion of your bill you pay based on how much you use. It's sometimes called a volumetric charge. And the orange part is your fixed charge, which is the amount you pay no matter how much you use. And the proposal is to raise it, well, there's a, a number of proposals on the table, but one of them is to raise it about triple from $10 to about $35. And the implication of this is essentially this, that people who use a little bit of electricity are going to pay more because they've previously been able to have a lot of control over how much they spend because most of the bill was based on how much you use. And then people who use a lot of electricity are going to pay less because the way that they're going to shift this is everybody's going to have a bigger chunk that they pay automatically every month. And then the charge per kilowatt hour, the charge for the energy that you use is going to go down. And so you're going to have less control over your bill. And this is problematic. I think I have four different reasons why this is a big, why this is a, a big problem for uh, not only the issue of energy democracy, but also in terms of the economics and, and the incentives that we give to people in our power system. So I'll start with energy efficiency. This is a chart from an investment bank. They put it out every year, which shows what's called the levelized cost of energy. And so the idea is here to compare renewable resources on the top to uh, fossil fuel resources on the bottom. Um, what I want to highlight is the bar that's on the left. That is the cheapest resource. That's energy efficiency. Energy efficiency is the cheapest way to meet a demand for new power generation, whether that's using rebate programs or giving away light bulbs or whatever it is. There's a whole bunch of ways that we can uh, that we can do this, but energy efficiency is the cheapest way. If you have more fixed costs, though, on your bill, you have removed the incentive for people to do energy efficiency because it's not going to make a difference. They're not going to save any money. So it becomes more and more difficult, even though it's the cheapest thing to do for customers as a whole, individual customers have less of an incentive to do it. So that's number one rule, reason why fixed charges are a lousy idea. Number two, it's bad economics. Um, the rationale behind it is that fixed costs mean you should have fixed charges. That if you have uh, something that you're selling where most of your costs on a, on a monthly or yearly basis don't change, then you need fixed charges. Guess who else has a lot of fixed costs? Starbucks. They've got stores and employees and equipment, but there's not a cover charge to go into a Starbucks and get a cup of coffee. You just pay what you pay for the coffee. Now, you pay a lot for the coffee, frankly, especially if you like a lot of things added into your drink, but there's not a cover charge. Um, and, and frankly, as I mentioned before, the problem is that we are giving people the wrong incentives. When people are willing to spend their own money on energy efficient appliances, on, on solar energy, on other ways that they can, uh, on, on programmable thermostats, we want them to do that. Because if it's going to reduce energy demand, it means we don't have to go out and build new power plants, which are really expensive. Um, and, and, and so uh, the problem we have right now is that this uh, utility argument makes all, it sort of rings it rings nicely in the ear that fixed costs mean we should have fixed charges, and it makes no economic sense whatsoever. A third thing is that sort of fixed charges act sort of like a crutch for the utility, because if they've removed the incentive for customers to change their behavior, uh, it means that when utilities make bad investments in things like new power plants, for which there might not have been actually a lot of demand, they're still able to recover those costs through the fixed charge portion on the line. So it, re it reduces accountability for the utility in terms of customers would be able to respond to bad choices the utility made that would raise rates, but now they're going to be less able to respond because more and more of the bill that they've got is going to have to be paid no matter what they do. And the last thing is, of course, is that it has an implication. You know, I've talked about energy efficiency a little bit, but it also has implications for things like solar. 
Uh, one fixed charge example from a utility in Iowa, which is probably not too far away from here, uh, a cooperative utility wanted to raise their fixed charge to $85 a month, so high that one of the farmers in that territory who had installed solar already um, said he was just going to take his solar panels down. It wasn't going to pay off to even have them running anymore because so little of his bill was going to be dependent on how much energy he used or how much energy he offset. He was going to be paying so much through the fixed charge. And in fact, the sad news is that there are a lot of utilities. In every state in red, there is at least one utility fighting at the local level or at the commission level or at the state legislature to try to make it uh, more difficult for folks to do on-site power generation through solar uh, for, or for energy efficiency. This represents battles about net metering or around energy efficiency or fixed charges. Uh, almost 40 states, there is some uh, fight going on about that. So the sad news is, although some utilities are recognizing that we uh, there's an opportunity to move forward here toward energy democracy and take advantage of the technology and the economics, um, a lot of them are, are struggling mightily with it. So what's possible? I always like to have this section because I think there's some really remarkable opportunities here um, to move forward toward energy democracy um, uh, across the country. So it's time for participation again. So how many states could get 100% or more of their electricity locally? So what that means is within their borders, the wind resource, the solar resource, the hydro resource, if, if that applies, how many states, and we're not talking about, you know, uh, the, looking at it from an engineering perspective about, you know, when the sun shines or doesn't shine or when the wind's blowing or not, but just on an annual basis as a whole based on how much energy could be produced from those sources and how much energy is consumed. How many folks think eight states? Is this renewable? Specific? Renewable only. Yes, thank you for clarifying that. 15 states. 30 states. 42 states. All states. I wish that was true. <laughs> but it's, it's becoming more true every year. So it's about 30 states, at least when we did this analysis in 2010. The good news is things are changing here, too. Uh, for example, with wind power technology, the turbines are getting more efficient. They're also getting taller, which is getting them up closer to the, to the, to the um, wind resource. Um, a second thing that's uh, is important to consider in this map uh, that I, is not highlighted in the legend is that we only looked at rooftop solar. Uh, since that's the least controversial from an environmental perspective. So there's lots of other solar that you could develop uh, uh, that would make a difference, especially in the southeastern states. Um, but it's really remarkable that in, in, in so many cases, uh, Nebraska included, um, that 100% or more of the electricity could, could come from renewable resources within those states. Uh, and even solar in particular. So I mentioned rooftop solar. This is uh, the driving force behind a lot of the numbers uh, that you saw in the previous chart. But almost every state could get tw at least 20% of its electricity from rooftop solar arrays on, on top of residential and commercial buildings alone. Nothing even on the ground, nothing in the farm, farm fields or anything like that. So just a remarkable resource available in every state. Uh, and just to highlight a little bit about what that is, this chart looks at by 2022 how much solar could be developed on ro those rooftops um, that, would be com that, that would be competitive with retail electricity prices with no subsidies. So this is you put up solar, you're not getting a tax credit or a rebate or anything. The cost of that electricity over a 25 or 30 year period when you average it out would be about the same as the price from that electric company. And this is with some very conservative assumptions about price inflation. It would be about 2,300 megawatts uh, here in Nebraska. And just to give you a sense of how much that is, there was a news story recently uh, or in 2014 about how Nebraska had uh, the Nebraska Public Power District had a new winter peaking record, so a new all-time record for energy consumption uh, on a winter day, and it was about 2,200 megawatts. You could meet that entire demand with solar that would be competitive with electricity prices without any subsidies on residential and commercial rooftops across the state. So it is a really significant number. Um, it's also, for another comparison, a little bit more than the size of a typical nuclear power plant. And of course, there are other drivers uh, in terms of the opportunity here. You have, you have costs coming down rapidly for solar, even as installations go up quickly. And, and I think, to me, this is one of the more powerful illustrations of what the possibility is. So it's not just looking at what the potential is, but what would happen if you actually tried to capture it. So uh, Georgetown, Texas made the news in the last year because it's a municipally owned utility. Um, their long-term contracts for power purchases were coming up uh, that were largely based on fossil fuels. Uh, the, City Council and the, uh, the managers of the electric company were looking at what their options were and they found that they could sign contracts for wind and solar to meet 100% of their electricity needs for the entire city um, and it would be cheaper than, the, than to uh, re-up with the fossil fuel companies. 
And so we said, oh, well, this is fascinating. Let's see what that would look like for municipal utilities across the country. So we picked all the municipal utilities that serve um, communities. I think it was 100,000 or more. There might have been another screen on this. I'm sorry, I can't remember exactly. You can email me after this if you want to know the gory details. Um, These charges, just power charges, or you got the fixed charges figured in too? I don't know anything about the power bill specifically. What this is is looking at what would be the price uh, to build and operate those power facilities. It's not including things like distribution costs and maintaining the grid. So this would not. This is like the wholesale price, not the retail price that you would pay on your bill. Um, so I, I don't take into account some of the billing issues. The idea here was how much is this renewable energy going to cost relative to fossil fuel energy. And in the Midwest, we have some of the cheapest power, and it's, of course, because of the great wind resource that we have, um, although the solar resource is getting cheaper every year. So what can we do about it? I think you guys already know what to do about it. Ken just gave, I think, a great 15 minutes on what you can do about it, and uh, I only have about three or four things, and I guess what I would say is use every tool at your disposal. Um, but here are a few things that came to mind as I was putting this together. Um, one is kind of get familiar with uh, what, what's happening in this. I, so I wrote this piece uh, about six months ago highlighting kind of the big picture here that we have in an electricity system what's an increasingly unnatural monopoly. Um, so if you want to get more in sort of the theoretical and philosophical underpinnings, go ahead and read more on my blog. If you like charts a lot, you should definitely read my blog. And if you want kind of more, uh, you know, stuff for the grassroots, um, check out some of the work that we're doing in Minneapolis with a group called Community Power or Minneapolis Energy Options. Um, which was a grassroots campaign in the city um, that I could tell you a little bit more about, uh, maybe in the question and answer period, uh, that drove the two investor-owned utilities into a partnership with the city around their climate action plan. Um, uh, fire back. You know, all of these cities, or all of these states, uh, have this pressure, have these policies um, show up at these meetings where you have utilities that are responsive to the public because they're publicly owned. And you already are. I mean, this is a great thing. I could... You know, I love the internet because I can go find pictures. I think I saw people looking around. Somebody in this audience in this picture? I wouldn't be surprised. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you for your work already. Um, but, uh, but also to vote. And this is, you know, and, and, and part of what I wanted to capture with this is not just that you, you know, voting and, and paying attention to municipal elections because obviously in this case they have implications for your uh, energy energy use uh, in your energy system, but also about making the election about energy issues. So in 2013, this Minneapolis campaign, a big part of our success was making sure that candidates were having to answer the question, what do you think about the idea of the city forming a municipal utility company? And that was driving an entire conversation then about what options that we had in order to uh, bring more energy democracy to localized decision making. So energy democracy is coming. Um, what I, want to, what I want to conclude with is um, a, a little bit of discussion, I guess, about the inevitability of what's happening. Because ultimately, um, there's only so much that the utilities can do to stop the kind of pressures that are happening from the, uh, the economic system, from the technological changes. Um, you know, a great example of this is like the landline phone companies. Um, you know, I'm assuming that most people in this audience have a smartphone, and probably nobody bought it from the landline phone company. And the same problem is going to be happening for electric utilities, which is a lot of the innovation is coming from outside the electric company. And a lot of it can work within the system that we have now, whether that's, you know, those little bill inserts that have smiley faces or programmable thermostats or whatnot, or things like energy storage that in places where there's particularly expensive electricity like Hawaii or California are becoming economical for homes and businesses today. To, to do what's called arbitrage, which means shift your energy use in order to just get lower prices or even go off the grid entirely. This, I think, is a good illustration of the problem that we have with the rules that keep the system the way they are. So the problem with a monopoly system is that for 80 to 100 years, you have the utility operating sort of this juggler. And imagine the little Lego pieces there as sort of the power plants and the demand from the utility customer. But there were a limited number of things to juggle, and the utility was in control of all of them. Now imagine that, you know, so imagine for a second that I'm the utility and I'm this juggler and I'm juggling these things. Now imagine that every single one of you has one of those Lego pieces. We could end up with a big problem because you're going to start throwing them in. You're going to install solar. You're going to be managing your own energy demand. There might be opportunities to aggregate with your neighbors. And all of a sudden it becomes really complicated for that one utility actor. And so this is driving, 
really frankly, very big conversations about the nature of utility monopolies and the rules for the system. In New York, they have a whole process called um, reforming the energy vision, where they're talking about transforming the utility from monopoly control of the system to be essentially like an open platform provider. Think of the internet for e-commerce, or think of the roads for you know uh, package delivery. You've got UPS and FedEx and the, and the Postal Service, and they're all competing on sort of these open uh, and, and competitive and non-discriminatory platforms. And, and what that might look like, again, apologies for the clip art, is that you have this independent local grid manager in the middle, and it could still be the utility company that we used to have. It's just that now they don't have to own the power plants anymore or be responsible uh, for those um, issues of uh, for all of the planning that goes into the utility system. Instead, they operate on a pair on, uh, using a set of open and transparent rules that anybody can follow. So the guy who owns the solar carport and a few electric vehicles can set, buy and sell and transact into the grid as he has energy to supply or energy uh, to take. Uh, homes and businesses that have uh, solar and storage would also be able to participate. Traditional power plants would be able to participate in this market, but it would be more of a level playing field, and it wouldn't involve the utility uh, having centralized control over it, and it, nor would it involve centralized power generation in the way that we have in the past. And I'll leave you with this, which is that ultimately what we may be talking about is the breakup of the electric monopoly, and that may happen in a lot of different ways. It may mean this sort of demotion that New York is talking about. It may mean in some places that the utility goes out of business, um, and, and it may mean a lot of different things. But what it means ultimately is that we're going to be breaking up uh, that sort of that centralized power model and that centralized power generation model, uh, and that the technology and the economics are really driving in a direction. And the question is, how do we change the rules to accommodate that? So I look forward to your questions. Thank you. I'm all for it. Is there a question over here? is uh, centralized power, and, and centralized power two different meanings of the word. One is that we centralize the generation of electricity, but we also centrally centralize the decision-making over our electricity system, uh, and that both of those things are important to that notion of monopoly. But the times, they are a change in, and there are a number of ways in which they're changing. I'm going to run through a few specific sort of technology-driven changes, but then also talk about what the big picture is and how that's uh, having enormous implications for this notion of how uh, we've had a game of monopoly um, in our electricity sector.